Deaths are brilliant. Deaths are good. People are very attracted to it, aren't they? There is something glamorous and exciting about them. It took on your heartstrings. Highly dramatic. <laughs> you get a big flashpoint. We brought it down. Blood and gore and slow motion. Cold and chilling. Out of the blue. That's awful. He's dead. If anybody actually did live on Coronation Street, I think it'd be classed as the most dangerous place to live in the world. Oh, there's, there's bodies everywhere. For more than 40 years, we've laughed and cried with Coronation Street. We've celebrated the many births and marriages and grieved for over 90 deaths. And this in a street with fewer than 15 houses. Coming up in this show, we take a look at some of the saddest moments in British soap. Come on now. Come on. Go behind the scenes of the most talked about TV deaths of recent years. Ah. And remember the scene where, for Martha Longhurst, the music simply stopped. The death of Martha Longhurst, being in the Rovers, was a particularly dramatic and uh, meaningful one. While all attention was elsewhere in the bar, Martha had a heart attack and expired in the snow. You all right, Mrs Longhurst? Oh, I'd only love to get used to supping wine in Spain, you know. When I was in the army, we always called it the... People used to write in saying, where can we send wreaths and things like that. I always felt that with Martha Longus it was some kind of tribute to her, that it was just this rather wonderful stillness. And you felt that because she died there, that uh, even now that things have moved on 40 odd years, this, that, that somehow she's still in there haunting it. Uh, a lot more than the others really, there's still some kind of texture of Martha that reminds you how long it's been going and how many kind of characters and deaths it's been through. Yeah, get the doctor! Actually, she was one of the first sort of big axings almost from Coronation Street. And that's the first of, of a great long line of uh, characters that had to uh, uh, leave a soap opera. And it was, a, you know, it was a lot about it in the papers. So off screen, it was actually quite a controversial and a big death, whereas on screen, it was, it was much littler. And obviously, when, when the scriptwriters decide or the producer decides that a character does have to leave, they often choose a death because that is very dramatic. And sometimes when they choose a death, they're saying, and you're not coming back. Although there was no way back for actress Lynn Carroll, who played Martha, the street moved on. Filming was no longer confined to the set, and the characters could come from further afield than Weatherfield, even further than Manchester. How long have you known Mr. Rashid? A while. How long is a while? I met him in July. Last month, I see. Where did you meet him? In Agadir. I was there on holiday. And him? He was working there. As? A waiter. What else do you know about him? He's not a criminal, if that's what you're suggesting. We're crazy about each other. He's my lover. Now, is there anything else you'd like to know? Deirdre was desperately in love with Sammy, and he was with her. It was love's young dream. Hello, Deirdre. Can he go now? Yes. Thank God for that. She went out to Morocco, she came back with this guy. Is that all the luggage you've got? It's enough. Then let's go home. And it was wonderful. She really, really loved Samir. Actor Al Najari, who played Deirdre's exotic toy boy, arrived on the street in 1994. I, I love the way he was represented with his halting language and his, his sort of hesitancy, as if this sort of... Everyone in the country could recognise that as a foreigner. Well, this is it. I'm, uh, I'm sorry about the welcome. It wasn't quite what I planned. <laughs> it was funny. Your face with that man. <laughs> you should have seen his when I told him you were my lover. You said that? Yeah. I don't know what came over me. The great thing about the hesitancy was so in those spaces was time. sex. And Deirdre was having the time of her life in the spaces between his sentences and, and just loved the way that he truly adored her and respected her and gave her great sex. He probably thought I was just another silly middle-aged woman making a fool of myself. I don't. If we decide that we need to have a death in a story, that the stakes need to be that high, the best way for that character to go is in a spectacular, possibly violent and certainly tragic moving scene. Do take the 
Deidre Anne Barlow to be my lawful wedded wife. So, just as Romeo and Juliet pledged their love to each other and were looking forward to a new exotic life together, the real world came crashing in to wake up love's young dream. Samir Rashid to be my lawful wedded husband. Tracy was out in a nightclub one night and took some ecstasy and was in a coma and she'd got kidney failure. So they desperately needed to find a donor. Samir, Deirdre's toy boy, Moroccan waiter, on his way to donate a kidney, you know, wonderful man, didn't deserve it, bang, beaten up by the canal. By the time he reached the hospital, he was actually brain dead. And of course, lots of Deirdre distraught acting as a result of that, which we like. Oh my God. My God, Sammy. It's awful to see Deirdre distraught because she does, you know, the whole well, the whole body, let's face it, becomes distraught, and it's represented by the neck area, isn't it, we have to say. Goodbye, Angel. Thank you. I love you so much. <laughs> Tragically, not all actors get the opportunity to play their death scenes. Join us after the break when we mourn the loss of Stan Ogden and the actor who played him, Bernard Ewens. You want me to take him washing, is that what you're saying? It's a pound a time, it's good money. Plus, we get a bit reckless on the roads. Deaths in Coronation Street have been many things, but few have been more touching than that of Stan Ogden. The death of actor Bernard Ewens in 1984 forced the street to write the untimely demise of one of British television's best-loved characters. Hey, Stan, I want your opinion. Do you think the black? Hmm. I say, which do you think, the black, or shall I wear the outfit I got for Eddie and Marion's wedding? I thought you sent one special to the cleaners. Yes, I did. I sent the black one to the cleaners. But this is new, you see. There's only one little spot on it, and that'll come out. As long as you clean. There's a little bit of Stan and Hilda in, in you know, most people that you know. There's a, a bit of that sort of a relationship. You know, he was the plodder, and she was the archetypal, you know, sort of bossy woman who dominated him, really, and got him to do things. Well, are you going to get yourself decent or what? Now, come on, get upstairs. There's enough hot water for a bath. I don't want a bath. Well, there was the classic one when they went to stay in the hotel. On their second honeymoon to, I think, Blackpool. She kissed Stan. And Stanley asked, what's that taste? And she said, woman, Stanley. Woman. <laughs> well, I feel smashing. <laughs> don't you? I feel all right, eh? Well, give us a kiss, then. Hey. You heard. Come on, you daft diaper. It is the second honeymoon, you know, not the first. Although, as I remember, you wasn't all that backward at coming forward then. What's that lipstick taste of? Woman, Stanley. Woman. He was the couch potato. She'd got a burning ambition to better herself, and you know, as long as she was saddled with that great lump, it would never happen. Good evening, sir. Madam. Would you care for a drink while you decide? Yes, thank you. Um, I'll have an, an am, am, amontillado. Certainly, madam. And sir? Let's be of any beer. Stan and Hilda were very believable because they had their squabbles, you know, they treated each other badly, they were at each other's throats all the time, but the basis of it was they loved each other and they needed each other. I think from the start, the writers seemed to cotton on to the fact that this was a situation between Stan and Hilda. So they began writing for that situation. This is a once in a lifetime. You spoil it for me and I'll strangle you. Stan Ogden was such a belting character. Uh, and, and, the, and the fact that, um, you know, whatever they went through, and whatever, however hard life was on them, they had each other. And it's such a great um, message to everybody, I think, you know, that that whatever happens and however cruel you know life can be, you, you can still find such joy in each other's company. At one time, they were the only stable married couple in the street at all, because all the others were either widows, widowers, 
or in the process of getting divorced or, or running around with somebody else. The Ogdens were the only ones who really stuck together all the time. I wouldn't swap you for any of that, look. Job. Nothing, Job. I uh, can't see her at the next table letting him run round in his vest and underpants, could you? <laughs> <laughs> there's only one way to describe Stan and Hilda Ogden's relationship, and there's a lot of love in that room. Oh, it has been a lovely evening. Yeah. I've enjoyed it. Thanks. Oh, Job. When Bunny started being ill, it was hard work at times, but um, he didn't mind because it was such a good partnership, you know, he didn't want it to finish. Could have gone on forever. Hello, sister. It's me, Mrs Ogden. You rang about my husband, Mr Stanley Ogden. I... Oh. I see. When? I'm sure you have. Yes. Yes, I will. Good night. Thank you for phoning. Well, it was a bit shattering, wasn't it? You know, having worked with somebody for 20 years and it had been so successful. He's gone, Alf. My stand's gone. It was tragic, really, that it should have happened so soon. Mm. Stan was such an amazing character, you know, he kind of epitomised Northern and, you know, everything that's solid and and he loved his wife even though, it, you know, it would have killed him to say it. And I just think that when, when he died, it was just, you couldn't really, I remember that she didn't have these ranty ravey scenes, she didn't have these big turmoily breakdowns, you know, to all her friends. She just had to kind of sit there and take her pain, you know. When we're doing a very sensitive scene like Stanley's death, you would probably schedule it to a quiet end of a day when all other activity is finished and just leave a very quiet set with that one actor. And then you would just allow her to get into the moment and centre herself and then do the scene. When you play emotional scenes, you don't do it really till the take. You rehearse it, but when you do it, you just let those emotions come out. You allow all your thoughts. You can think about the actor as well and the character and the tears flood out. And if it's well shot and well written, it's a very poignant moment. And if the, the viewers are also missing the character and in tune with what's going on, the moment becomes stronger and better. That's what it's all about. When he'd gone after the funeral, Hilda started to open the parcel and there's his pyjamas and there's his slippers and there's his dressing gown. And then it comes to his glasses case. When she came to that, there's this pair of glasses with no eyes behind them. And that was the final shred, you know, the, the, the final, final straw. That's how it is. I mean, it was very accurate in that respect. I mean, I remember finding uh, a letter that my mum had written me and to see her handwriting again after sort of 10 years. It's, it catches you, catches you on the heart. <laughs> so she did have a bit of a weep then. It was just the last thing of the glasses and there was no stand behind them. When it comes to deaths, the street has a lot to answer for, for it is the streets of Weatherfield that have been the cause of quite a few. Go back, you stupid!
Queenie! As one marriage ended as a result of a road death, another marriage ending was the cause of a road death. A divorce. You want a divorce? Les, it's over between us. I think she got fed up with Les's scheming ways and messing about with other women and taking her for a ride, basically. He was always taking money off her. I mean, maybe that was the last straw for her. Me and Dennis are good together. And no matter how much you hope it's going to fall to pieces, it's not. When Dennis arrived, he ended up living with Les and Janice. And he fell in love with Janice. Nobody was out to hurt anybody. It was just the way it was. Sometimes these things happen in life and couples split. And nobody's actually a bad person. It just, that's the way it happens. And it was good for people to see that. Jan, I don't suppose you believe me. But I always loved you, you know in my own way. Your way was never good enough. I think Les genuinely loves her, but I think he was um, upset, devastated, um, because of his ego. The idea that you know Les would be saying he was going to kill himself and everything, and you kind of knew that was rubbish, because he's not the kind of guy, he wouldn't have the courage, or whatever it takes, he wouldn't have it. Uh, and that Dennis, because he was such a decent man, such a good man, would race to, to, to try and save Les, who would become the bane of his life, really. And you can see it coming a mile off, the fact that uh, by trying to save Les's life, racing him to hospital, you know, he gets in a crash, a terrible crash, you know, comes to an awful end. Les! Come on, mate! Come on! Let's get you out of here, come on! When we were told that Dennis was going to be killed off, I was upset for Janice, because I think that she'd finally found some happiness, you know. I was happy for Charles because it meant that he had a good ending and something, you know, meaty to get into. Come on, Les, mate. Stay awake now. Come on, wake up! Wake they asked me to get a few screeches and squeaks and things out of the car, which is physically impossible because it was a heap of rubbish. And uh, so I couldn't drive it fast or get any wheel spin or do anything. And then all the, uh, the, uh, the guys who supply the vehicles went, oh, we'll do it, and got in and couldn't do it either. In true Corrie style, Dennis ended up in Weatherfield General with a bunch of tubes stuck up his nose. We'd been out the night before, actually, if I'm totally honest, because I was starting the job the day after I finished, so I couldn't go out for last night with the guys. So I was feeling a bit hungover, and at one point I actually fell asleep. He was dying and we just heard this... <laughs> and it, like all the paramedics and me went, he's asleep, him. <laughs> Nurse, he's awake. He's awake, nurse. Dennis! Dennis! He was awake, but Dennis, does he talk? Can you hear me? Stand back from the bed. What? Dennis, can you hear me? Stand back! Dennis, can you hear me? Can somebody get a doctor in the resource trolley? If you're playing like a death scene like that, I mean, as much as I like Charles, and I do, I don't love him, I'm afraid. So um, you have to personalise it for somebody that, that you care that deeply for, and then it kind of comes naturally if you believe it. <laughs> like the demise of Dennis, most deaths on the roads of Weatherfield come like a bolt out of the blue. Happy driving one day, dead the next. The same cannot be said of Don Brennan. He was a road traffic accident waiting to happen. Why me, Don? I mean, what have I ever done to you? I thought you might be able to get that husband of yours to show some remorse for what he's done. I had everything going for me and Josie till he wrecked it. What have I got now? Nothing. He bought the garage from Mike and, and thought that uh, he'd done rather well in the, in, in the buying of it. And it was actually a, a terrible buy and went terribly wrong. He conned us. No, you conned yourself. You got yourself into that mess. John was a very lonely, sad loser, really, <laughs> basically. The poor chap. You got yourself into the state where you felt you got nothing to live for, not Mike! It's possible with any character that you come to the point where you've just run out of stories and ideas for them, where the character's purpose, if you like, within the community, the purpose on the programme, uh, has come to an end. Ah, oh, Don Brennan. You see, I've got a very soft spot for Don Brennan. Have you any idea how I felt when I got this letter? Realising that when I read it, that you expected to be 
Well, go on, say it. Dead. If you felt bad when you read that letter, I'm glad. From time to time, we do have characters who've become overloaded, where we've put them through every hoop you can think of, and uh, there's nothing else for them to do. Have you got any idea what it's like to be so far into that big black hole that you can't see any way out? That black hole wasn't the only thing Don was having problems seeing out of. The windscreen in his taxi was giving him problems too. You liar! You liar! No! Don, driven to despair, tried to take his own life and that of Alma's. But as it was Don, he failed miserably. The fire brigade who fished it out said, Anybody who was in that crash, no way you would come out with a couple of scratches, you know, no way you would be obliterated, you know, as the dummies were. <laughs> so, yes, there we were, a decorative couple of scratches. So, yeah. <laughs> if I'd a bit longer in that car, I'd have talked him out of it. I still feel that he was going to reverse, but what he did is put his foot on the wrong gear, which we went. But that wasn't the end of Don's ill fortune on the roads of Weatherfield. Still deadly determined to get even with Baldwin, Don hopped over to the factory for a duel to the death with Mike. He just couldn't win against Mike Baldwin. And it was fixed in his head then, wasn't it? That somehow, some, some way, he was going to get even with Baldwin. Ow! In the end, he didn't kill himself. You know, he went to kill someone else. You know, he, he actually went to try and kill Mike Baldwin, you know, as if the loser was, was, was coming back. He smashed me over the head. He said he was going to kill me. He phoned the police. Oh, God, he's got the keys. The car, the flat, phone Alma. The fact that uh, the, the murder went horribly wrong and he did end up killing himself in a way, you know, by the sheer disaster of it. But a fant great end, actually. That was one of the good Corey ends, Don, Don Brennan's end. <laughs> Nobody ever mentioned it to me that he'd actually driven my car into a wall. It was never mentioned to me that I'd lost my car. Nobody mourned it in the script. But when it came to Alma's demise, the script certainly did mourn her loss. Join us in part three when we get the cast's reactions to her death. Yeah, it's really sad. And find out exactly how murderous Jez Quigley met his end. He should have gone out and by being decapitated or having um, a crucifix burned into his forehead or something. <laughs>Probably the most upsetting death in Coronation Street in recent years was that of Alma Halliwell. Played for over 20 years by actress Amanda Barry, it dealt with a subject rarely touched on by British soaps, cancer. I've got to go to a hospital for some tests. Some tests? <sighs> yeah, they, um, uh, they think they found um, a growth. Oh, I actually did say, please can I die? I, because I didn't want ever to be one of those people that left a soap and then wanted to go back in. So, but I hadn't, I hadn't realised it would be um, cancer. I wish you told me this before. I couldn't. <laughs> something's wrong, Audrey. I just know it. I mean, some, something's wrong. No, don't be silly. You haven't even had the test yet. <laughs> yes, but I just know it. I just I keep trying not to say it or to think it, like... Like, it won't exist if I can just keep it out of my head. I think most GPs are quite happy that um, programmes, you know, highlight diseases, highlight symptoms, make the public aware of these conditions. I mean, they're doing a job for us, and that's great. And, and if you can detect cancers early, that's what you want to do, because many cancers can be cured if you catch them early enough. I'm frightened, Audrey. I'm really frightened. I think, you know, a really important thing to remember was that after the storyline, there was a really sharp rise in number of people going for, uh, going for smear tests. Cervical smear tests went up by 200%, you know, after that story was shown. 
that is tremendous um, public health initiative. Great value. Cora dealt really, really well with um, women's health issues. I think uh, it's something, well, women and men's health issues, it's, I think both subjects which are very important. Uh, and I think they did a very good job of combining the drama of it with actually telling people how important it is to get things sorted out as soon as possible, really. As you know, all the tests have come back, and I'm sorry to say it isn't good news. The biopsy has shown that you do have cancer of the cervix. Oh, I knew it. Could there be some mistake here, though? I'm afraid not. Y are you sure? Because, I mean, we wouldn't be here now if they hadn't made a mistake with a smear test, you know. I understand that. And we could have picked up on it sooner if Miss Halliwell hadn't missed the previous smear test. But these tests are conclusive. So how bad is it? She had developed cancer that had grown to such a degree that they more or less gave her the uh, answer that even if she had treatment, it wasn't necessarily going to do much good. So, um, will I have to have an operation? Your condition is incurable, I'm sorry. Oh, my God. Now, there must be something you can do. I know there was some criticism of the speed with which it occurred, but that's one of the necessary elements of soap. Uh, we truncate time. Uh, a pregnancy doesn't take nine months. It takes somewhat less than that. And the same with uh, an event like uh, a tragedy of someone dying of cervical cancer. Uh, but how, other than that element of making it fit within the time scale of the drama, I think they, they treated the issues very well. It was about a woman knowing she had a finite amount of time to sort out her life and almost tie up all the loose ends and doing that and then saying goodbye. And that was beautifully done. And you don't get to see that very often in soap. I just loved the idea that there was these two kind of slightly lonely women kind of clinging onto each other. The tenderness of the way that they were very much together and very much sharing this kind of you know horrible journey into an early death. I like listening to you. It makes me feel like everything's normal. I kind of thought it was very moving in their lovely little house that they had. I am very happy just sitting here with you. <laughs> oh. It's just a twinge. No tears. Ooh. Amanda Barry was famous in her own right before Corrie, so it's almost like we were saying goodbye to that a little bit as well. You know, the sort of a goodbye to this this great sort of English actress that's given us some, so much pleasure. And, and I thought that was all kind of worked up really well, despite the fact that it was such a a sort of quite a gruelling way to die. When I read the script, I thought, oh, good gracious, they've got everybody around the bed. I thought, how unrealistic. And of course, people do. And as it happened, it was so moving that everybody was there, because they were all her friends. I don't know, go away for a couple of days. Come back, you've got the house full of people. Hmm? Well, I'm here now. Gail's with me. Curly drove for Suffolk. We've only just got off the train, actually. I haven't had time for a cup of tea or anything. What made it sad was that Audrey, to hide her terrible inadequacy and not really being able to cope, tried to be jolly, as you do. It makes me sad to think about it, actually. And said, um, oh, dear. Uh, yes, it's making me really sad. Um, come on, you know, and I haven't had a cup of tea yet, and just dashed from the station and all that. Um, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, it's really sad. Sorry. But I think that happens, doesn't it? Yeah, you try and be jolly and it doesn't really work. Everything's going to be all right now, lovey, because I'm going to look after you. I'm here now, and I'm not going anywhere. Come on. Come on, Alma. Come on.
I'm sorry. She's gone. <laughs> I watched lovely Sue Nichols sitting on the bed, and they'd been friends, you know, in real life for quite a while anyway. And you could see that, you could see the friendship, you could see the characters, and that got me, and I just thought, ooh, you know, that's really sad. It was like one of those contests when people go into, uh, how many people can you get into a telephone box? I've never seen so many people, and they didn't even give me room to die. Alma left a video to show to her friends, and the amount of cast that were, that were crying because it was from Amanda, but it was really sad. I've had a wonderful life, and a lot of that's been down to you lot. I just cannot believe I'm not going to see you all again. Audrey, you've been one of the best mates anybody in the whole world could have, and, and thank you. Thank you for sort of dragging me through these last few months. <laughs> I haven't been the greatest house guest in the world, and I'm really going to miss you. No tears, eh? Huh? Though you've all meant so much to me. But by the time you watch this, I'll be gone, so thank you. <sighs> Just remember me, eh? Now spare a thought for those characters who die at the hands of their fellow man. For such a small street, it's seen more than its fair share of murders. Oh, there's, there's bodies everywhere. As regards um, murderous deaths on Coronation Street, um, in the very early days of uh, Coronation Street, uh, Ernie Bishop's demise was quite dramatic. Ernie Bishop, shotgun, wagey snatch at the, at the factory. Just give us the money, mate, and you won't get hurt. Pardon? You heard. Give us the money. Now just keep your mouth shut and give us the money. Put it in that bag. I always thought it was the kind of way of saying, if any other actor wants to get out of this programme quick, this is what happens to you. How's it going? They're taking the... You bloody idiots! Come on, let's get out of here! Tomo! It was a great idea that he would die in the factory. Terrible things seem to happen in the Baldwin orbit because he represents, you know, evil, if you like. Ernie. I do miss Ernie because I hate Emily being on her own as much as it gives us great comedy scope occasionally. I, I miss Ernie. And, uh, and oddly enough, the other great death I always thought was funny was Brian Tilsley. Oh, gosh, yes. He was murdered too, wasn't he? Get off me! I actually worked on the show with Chris, that time with Donald Worthington. Oi, knock it off! And I have fond memories of him because he used to drive me around um, and we used to do, he showed me his clubs and all that kind of thing and uh, he was very, very generous to me actually. Well, while everything was going on in the 80s in Manchester and club, the club world and everything, you know, the only representation of Manchester club world that happened in 89, which was about the time of the Stone Roses, was Brian Tisley being stabbed outside a nightclub. And that was the only sign in Coy that really Manchester was going through this sort of Manchester thing and that there was a hint that Manchester was the centre of the club, clubbing world. <laughs> I think that him getting knifed and the fact that he was actually murdered and that he could never come back in the programme, that, that was quite a, a dramatic one. At least Ernest and Brian had the opportunity to play their death scenes. The same could not be said for actor Lee Warburton. You have a son, Anthony Horrocks. Yes, that's right. When did you last see him? Denise Welsh was brilliant. She sort of disowns Tony, she slaps him round the face, she's like, Get out, I never want to see you again, you're dead. We didn't exactly part on good terms. What's he done now? Do you recognise this? Yeah, it's um, Tony's signet ring. Why? It was found on the body underneath Victoria Street. No. I'm sorry, Mrs Barnes, but we have reason to believe the body may be that of your son. I got some very strange and sad news one day. I was doing a tour of a play and I got a phone call off Denise Welsh, who played Natalie, my mum, uh, saying, hi, hi, Lee, how are you doing? I haven't spoken to you in a bit. I was going, hi, how are you? She goes, oh, yeah, we're fine. Um, we're at your funeral. And I was like, you what? what? Yeah, you're dead. As far as the Tony Horrocks character is concerned, I never, I never actually worked with him at all. Um, he left long before I'd, I'd even got there, and I kind of came into the show as Jez Quigley as the guy that murdered Tony Horrocks. Of course, Steve was the only witness to this who could actually bang him up. And uh, Steve testified in court against Jess Quigley. Do you find the defendant guilty or not guilty of murder? Not guilty. Come on!
the best thing was I had my biggest storyline when I wasn't even there. You know, I didn't even have to turn up to work and I got uh, murdered, found, court case, gangsters, everything. I didn't even have to get out of bed. It was brilliant. I think the fact that, you know, Tony died off screen was just a perfect opportunity for a storyline without having to pay him. <laughs> but it was payback time for Steve. What? I'll see you later, Stevie boy. Me and you have got a lot to talk about. Jazz had to get Steve out of the way quickly, so he arranged for uh, his horrible death by Rottweiler. <laughs> Which was nice. Listen, I know this great little bar in town. Uh, maybe we could get... And I had this in my, in my mind, Jack Nicholson in The Shining, um, doing the Here's Johnny bit. And um, I remember just sort of seeing him and going, Stephen James MacDonald, come on down! And that's like my all-time favourite moment because it was just wasn't pre-planned in any way at all. Right, Chess, what are you doing here? Well, I'm waiting for you, big fella. Listen, Jess, I thought we'd sorted all this out. Steve, now, you're going to have to start seeing this from my point of view. You grasp me up. Listen, Jess, don't kill me, I'm begging you. Oh, please, oh, don't beg me. Look, I'm not going to do anything, am I? They are. But don't worry about these lot. I tell you, they are very, very skilled indeed. Just lie back, close your eyes, and think of England. And it'll all be over before you know it. I'll tell you something, though. It's just been wonderful and while it lasted. He did it with such relish, didn't he? he? He kind of, you know, the whole threatening of people and getting stuck in. He was having the time of his life, I think. We had an absolute ball. We wound each other with practical jokes constantly. Fortunately for Steve, he managed to survive and was rushed to Weatherfield General. Unfortunately for Jez... Super Jim, Steve's dad, has got, has got him beat him up and cracked his ribs. And would you believe it, he ends up in the bed next to Steve. Well, you are not a well boy, are you, Stevie? Hey, I wonder what happened if all your juices dried up. Jez! I kind of really thought there might be a, a moment of surprise here that Steve might go, you know, and he's one of my favourite characters, so I was like, oh, man, no, no. And then fantastic moment just as Jez is about to kill him. <coughs> oh, that's better. Can you loud and clear? Don't hurt me, Jez, please. Just for framing, I'd have to kind of be over the top of, of Simon, and uh, he was just completely freaked out by it and screaming, saying, oh, my God, this is what it must be like for Jenny. Who's my wife. <laughs> as I'm mounting him. Can you believe he said that? I was so, I was just like, I can't believe he said that. And now he just keeps saying that he has nightmares about it. But he was kind of laying on top of me going, ugh, ugh. And whenever he was kind of crying on the bed, he'd kind of be sniggering at the same time because I'd be looming over him. And I thought, God, poor women, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but anyway. <laughs> Stephen, people are asleep. We don't want to wake him up, do we? What, his own ribs puncture his lung or something and he collapses? <laughs> Fantastic, you know. Uh, great, great death scene, that, you know, kind of, you know, just about to kill Steve McDonald and, and, and then you die because you're Steve McDonald's father's actually beaten you up previously. Brilliant. I was disappointed. I felt it was a little bit of a damp squib the way he kind of died. It wasn't the way that you know, a character like Jess Quigley should have gone out. He should have gone out and by being decapitated or having um, a crucifix burned into his forehead or something. Or just a hail of bullets would have been fantastic. Well, as fantastic deaths go, there have been few to match that of Richard Hillman's. Join us after the break when we go behind the scenes of a one-man killing spree. Great, thank All you, right. <laughs> kids in the house, you don't want that sort of thing lying around, do you? I saw you with them. It was the night Maxine was murdered. When it comes to deaths in Coronation Street, recently there have been quite a few. And they've all been caused by the same person. Where's this girl? 
Well, what's bothering you? Something is. Richard Hillman, played by Brian Capron, joined the street in June 2001. A cousin of Alma's, it wasn't long before he won the heart of Gail with his promises of health, wealth and happiness. But Hillman, believe it or not, was living a very big lie. I always tell the truth, Gail. I don't think anybody was safe from Richard Hillman simply because it was the most extraordinary storyline I've ever seen. When he came into um, Coronation Street, he had no idea that Richard was going to be like he was. They did want people to kind of throw things at the television and go, don't you know what he's doing? It just developed. I mean, I think it just grew. I don't think anybody knew at the beginning um, how it was going to end, I'm pretty sure. I really didn't know, and I don't think anybody knew, the extent of, of um, the murdering and chaos he, could, he would cause. That chaos kicked off with the death of Dougie Ferguson, Richard's partner in a property development. It's just business. Look, I'll replace everything. I'll do everything by the book from now on. Get lost, Dougie. You had a chance, and you blew it. Oh, come on, Richard! Please, we can't leave... <laughs> <laughs> The first victim was Dougie. He, in fact, didn't murder him. He left him believing that he was actually dead, and he was actually shocked himself. Of course, what he did do was didn't call an ambulance and uh, went, went to filch a lot of money off of him. I'll do whatever it takes to ruin you. One death led to another, and so there was no stopping Richard when his ex-wife decided to stick her oar in. You can kiss goodbye to that nice little family you've got going for yourself. It's all going to end for you, Richard. Oh. <laughs> Just try stopping me. Some deaths happen and are not really mourned. For instance, Richard Hillman's wife, his, her murder, uh, really didn't have very much effect on the street because she was not an, a well-established character. As Patricia Hillman joined Dougie Ferguson in that green room in the sky, Richard, hiding behind the guise of a loving family man, turned his money-grabbing attentions towards an unsuspecting Emily. Deaths heighten the expectations of the audience. I mean, soap tends to work on the basis that the audience is always ahead of the characters within the, the drama. So usually the audience are well aware something very horrible is going to happen or something very tragic is going to happen to a particular character within the soap. I think there's absolutely no way this storyline could have happened in the street 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, people just wouldn't have put up with that sort of thing in those days. There would have been far too many complaints. Mary Whitehouse would have been jumping up and down and wet in her knickers, you know. I mean, it would have never happened. But happen it did, and it was just about to happen again. Hi, Emily. Richard. What the hell are you doing? Of course, he's thrown into complete confusion, and he panics. You should have stayed at the party, Maxine. No! <laughs> of course, on, on the day, I actually struck up four times with the crowbar in a frenzy to make it, uh, in, in my act, said, trying to make it different to the one sort of solid blow to Emily. Because of the watershed, of course, in, in Coronation Street, you have to be very sensitive to it, and you have to make sure that you... you uh, have enough impact for the audience to make it exciting and satisfying, but not, on the other hand, uh, do it like a Sam, Sam Peckinpah film with uh, blood and gore and slow motion. I actually had a frenzy kind of all, but they cut that down to, to, to one I'm glad to say. I love uh, Tracy Shaw, and we were, ah, oh, quite friendly. Um, I was a bit like a surrogate mum, I think, both on screen and off. But I did walk into makeup and came face to face with this starring friend of mine who looked terrible. Well, we're in the pub, we're just in the pub. As an actor, you've got you've got to put yourself through them emotions, you know, of actually thinking that someone close to you has died. I mean, I've never lost anyone close to me, touch wood. But um, doing the scenes, I was thinking some terrible thoughts in my head, and it it, it was difficult to do. You're gonna have to let Maxine go now, Ashley. Oh, what you taking away from me? It's all right, it's all right, Ashley. Let these medics all look after him. Come on. Come on, there we go, come on. I've worked with Tracy for seven and a half years, and obviously with, with Tracy leaving, it was a bit upsetting. 
It, when, when she actually left, it, it it didn't seem like she was going because we, I had a scene straight after and like you know we give her a bouquet of flowers and give her a, a leaving presents and stuff. But we just it was just like we did a scene and she went. It's been uh, quoted before, you know. Everyone says it's one, it's one, it's like one big happy family in Coronation Street. But it is, and it, it's you know, it's it's for the simple reason that you're there up to twelve hours a day, all in one room. So it is hard when people go. They are very much missed in the green room, you know. And in a street so small, it was only a matter of time before Gail suspected Richard and he was forced to confess. Yes, it was me. It was me what done it, Joe. I think by the end, Richard had lost every sandwich in the picnic. He certainly had. So much so that he shoved Gail and the kids in the car and decided to drive them to Kingdom Come. In his head, he, he, he was taking them all home. I mean, he was a very ill man by that point. But in his head, he was taking them all to heaven, keeping them all together. It was the only way he knew how to keep them all together. And he was, it was just very sad, really. This is it! quite liked him not to have ever been found and to a, a question mark to have hung over him but whether he was alive or dead. I think the thing with the Richard Hillman story it was it was played out just long enough and it needed a very dramatic and clean finish as far as I was concerned and as, uh, as regards uh, how they felt. So I think we're all very happy with that. <laughs> that, uh, that curry I think was off. <laughs> <laughs>